things we didn't like. Now we're talking about being more proactive, and this takes it, I think, a step further. So part of the research I found was with Mr. Paul Herman, and he's been doing some very interesting stuff. And I'll go ahead and make a pitch, and you can send my check in the mail. Um, his book is fascinating, and he's developed portfolios, equity, fixed income, and real estate that can be analyzed for their social impact and social factors and sustainability. So I'd like Paul to talk about that and some of the evidence that he's uh, discovered and proven that this is things we should be doing absolutely under our fiduciary duty. So thank you, Paul. Great, thank you, Lauren. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you everybody for waking up uh, early on a Labor Day morning and, uh, and sharing, and uh, to our friends from uh, Japan, Ohio Gazaimos. Uh, <laughs> this. Um, so uh, this is meant to be a conversation, and, um, uh, and so if you have questions, please ask them along the way. So I'm going to give an overview of some of the evidence of how impact investing, what impact investing can be, and why it can be just as uh, or potentially more compelling than traditional investing. So again, if you have questions, feel free to ask along the way. I will set this up, and uh, uh, thank you, Lauren, for the. Uh, uh, <laughs> recognition of the book, uh, which is actually available on ebook as well. Um, it's integrated into 18 uh, curricula, uh, including Presidio Capital Markets. Um, and I just discovered it's an audio book as well, uh, which you can get on Amazon or Audible. So we're going to talk about, uh, Lauren mentioned the word ESG. So ESG, does anybody know what this stands for? Yeah? So what is it? Environmental, social, and governance factors. And um, uh, so you'll actually see reports on environmental social governance come out from BlackRock, which is a, a trillion dollar uh, asset manager across the way. Uh, if anybody has any iShares in their portfolio, that, those are BlackRock products. <clears throat> in addition, UBS just put out a, a big publication, ESG Investing, uh, saying that there's strong client demand and that clients are uh, across, um, all types of investors are demanding this. Individual investors, institutional investors, high net worth investors, and the like. So when you hear that term ESG, uh, you can think about that. It's different from the historical uh, definition of something called SRI, socially responsible investing. So in the, in the 1980s when apartheid uh, was occurring uh, and culminating, uh, the end of apartheid was culminating in South Africa, there was a large protest by students, not unlike students protesting today about climate change, uh, to divest South Africa. And today some of the students are uh, not only seeking to do more impact investing for their college endowments, but also city, state, and uh, county pensions working with uh, nonprofits like 350.org and Go Fossil Free are doing the same. So there's a lot of energy both this week with social capital markets uh, the leadership that Lauren is showing on the impact investing initiative in trying to bring this to institutional as well as individual investors. Um, and if you don't have a book yet, uh, there's books at the back. That's a summary of um, conversations that Lauren has led and stimulated in concert with the Federal Reserve. So the San Francisco Federal Reserve helps to publish material as well as host conversations um, to do that. So lots and lots of positive energy and enthusiasm. And so before we go any further, please read this. <laughs> this just says, uh, like some of you in the room, I'm a registered investment advisor. Everything we're going to talk about is for your information and education. There are no investment recommendations implied in any of this, and past performance is not indicative of future return. Okay. So the intersection of impact investing uh, for me and uh, what several people see is that <clears throat> there's people who want to do good and there's people who want to make money. So raise your left hand if you, like, if you want to do good. I imagine it would be most of us. And raise your right hand if you want to make money. Okay. Now raise both your hands if you want to do both like you already have. <laughs> So this is what impact investing, ESG investing, socially responsible investing is about. It's about doing good and making money at the same time. Now to get that message across, sometimes we need to just talk from this vocabulary. So to get traditional investors, whether they're trustees of pensions and endowments, whether they're advisors and brokers in big or small uh, financial firms, we need to approach it from 
well, how do you make money? Because the history of social responsible investing is because they have sought to reduce risk, and however we distill this going forward, if you rem remember just one thing from this morning, this is all about reducing future risk. The risk of environmental, social, and governance risks. So governance risk is really understood today. You should have independent board members. You should have diverse boards because they make the organization stronger. Environmental factors are starting to come around because private equity investors like Jeremy Grantham are helping to eliminate how environmental-based investing reduces risk and has the potential to increase return. So reduce future risk. Whenever you talk to somebody with an investment background, you're trying to persuade them, make this one of your key messages, reduce future risk. Because I just told you that past performance is not indicative of future return. Why? Because most investors don't study future risk as much as they study historical risk. So when you see things like Morningstar ratings of three, four, five stars, all of that is based on historical risk and historical return. And so the field of ESG investing, impact investing, and social responsible investing is built around evaluating future risk and future return. We're gonna talk about both of them. And again, ask questions at any time. So one of the things that we do is like Morningstar, we rate the sustainability, impact, and ESG factors. And then we map, them, and that's this human impact, and then we map them to profit potential. So in this uh, two by two grid, so I used to work at McKinsey, sorry, I have to make everything a two by two, <laughs> is this x-axis, remember we talked about do good or make money? That's a one dimensional question. Do good or make money. It's really no less than a two dimensional question. How much good, what is the x-axis of impact? And how much money, what is the y-axis of profit? And you can do this for any portfolio. You can plot stocks on this two by two grid. You can plot bonds on this two by two grid. You can plot funds. What we've done here is plot asset classes. So for a sample family office that uh, we advise, uh, which is in the 50 to $100 million range, they have beauty bonds in their portfolio, private equity, public equity, and hedge funds. And each of these investments, whether it's a large public company, a small private company, a uh, muni bond in the city of Oakland or Port of Oakland, a hedge fund. They all communicate some level of information and some level of performance. And so we're going to talk, we're going to walk through what that is. But what this shows for this time period, this 2000, uh, uh, early 2010, is muni bonds offer the potential because they invest for public benefit, which you also get a tax advantage for, some of the highest impact to profit ratios. Private equity, companies where the owner or founder can drive the business, is in this top right grid. This line right here is 50. We think of the 0 to 100 scale of the HIP scale, which we talked about in the book, being net benefit to society or net cost to society of a different spectrum. And so large public companies have a hard time being so large at scale to balance with the environment, social, governance, and things like human capital. And then hedge funds out here, in many cases, you just don't know. Because they don't talk about what they do. And so as an investor, if you're trying to understand the risk of what you're invested in, you're going to have a very hard time with most hedge funds. Because, first of all, they don't tell you what they're investing in. And two, they might not even tell you as an investor what their strategy is beyond a headline. So, but private yeah. equity isn't like that too, that there isn't really that much transparency. Why, why there is a fundamental difference? There's a fundamental difference because private equity firms, when investors ask, will let you talk to the private equity holdings. Mm -hmm. The hedge funds are very dubious about somebody trying to copy their approach. And so, they, in general, they don't. The leading hedge funds do, but that's why you're seeing after the 2008 meltdown, hedge funds opening up public market vehicles because there's so much skepticism around the lack of transparency, the ability to see inside the hedge fund, and um, uh, the liquidity. So hedge funds usually don't let you take your money out for three, six, nine, 12 months. And so there's a move to, to public funds. 
And you're meaning mutual funds by equity mutual funds, correct? correct. Um, yeah, in this case, these are uh, all stocks in that. We now have the ability to do stocks and bonds. And so if you had a bond mutual fund indicator, that would be different, right? Yeah, it, it would. And there's yeah. some that are a mix of stocks and bonds and target date. But that's not part of that? Not system. this particular one. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So how does this work? So who here owns an S&P 500 mutual fund? Okay. All right, when, you, when you're investing in that fund, this is the top 500 public companies in the US, it actually has about 30 to 50% international revenue. So you, you're buying a US-based company, but you're buying all the markets that they're in around the world. Now, back in 1975, the market value was 83% physical capital. Land, buildings, computers, tangible assets, all things that sit on the balance sheet. Today, since about 2005, 80% or thereabouts, this is not an estimate, this is the actual number, 80% is intangible. So anybody know what an intangible asset is? It's a goodwill. So goodwill. Brand. Brand. Patents. Patents. People. So goodwill and patents are all on the balance sheet. But this 80%, is off balance sheet market value. Yeah. This is the price you're paying in excess of what's on the financial statements. So is that roughly a price to book ratio? So it's roughly a price to book ratio. Yeah, the patents are only the cost of development, but not the real value that you can earn. That, that can be 10 times, five times. It depends on the patent. Yeah, sure. But what other factor could be in there? the value of the patents in excess of their cost, what other value could be in that 80%? Human capital. Human capital. People. Does anybody know where people are on the financial statements? Cost. They're at expense on the income statement. So remember in econ, you learn like the factors of production are land, labor, and capital. Land is an asset. Labor is an expense. So how we've gotten ourselves into a situation here is when CEOs of public companies want to deliver profit, typically their number one cost is people. So to increase profit, unless you're growing revenue, you need to reduce cost. And the cycle that we're in is reducing people cost or switching out people cost, switching out high cost labor for lower cost labor or high income labor for lower income. So inside this 80%, I will challenge you to find companies who know how to drive the value of this 80%. Because those are environmental social governance factors and human capital, Great. Right? I've got a kind of broad question that just hit me that I was, having heard you give this before. Yep. People, expense, people asset means the company owns people, so therefore that creates a philosophical challenge that we can't own these employees. So therefore, what's the middle ground that we can offer that value without making it like the company owns them? Sure. Okay. So okay. it doesn't necessarily mean that the company owns the people. But I mean, that's where the framework could go. So how do we address it? Could go. Yeah. yeah. It could go backwards, 150 more years <laughs> yeah, into but... companies owning people. But essentially, <laughs> the workforce and the value it provides is an asset. So how do we quantify that so it doesn't go backwards? Right, so that's actually, that's actually um, already been done. And I'll show you a chart where that's been done oh. in just a moment. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so next time you're talking to somebody inside a public company, ask them if they know what drives their market value. And they're gonna say, of course we know what drives our market value. And then talk about what's the either price to book or tangible versus intangible and ask them if they understand where that comes from. Because in general, companies don't have metrics for the 80%. They have metrics for the 20%. They don't have metrics for the 80%. And this 80%, if you're holding this, and you don't understand where this is coming from, just like owning a hedge fund, or you don't understand what's in, owned in it, you're not gonna know why this is gonna go up or down. All right, so that's why this is so important. And so interestingly, uh, there's a company where that data came from, Ocean Tomo. And Ocean Tomo actually ran a investment fund uh, called the Ocean Tomo Patent Exchange Traded Fund from late 2006 and then stopped in the first quarter of 2012. And for that time period, 
This red line is the S&P 500. This blue line is a fund of U.S.-based or U.S.-listed stocks, both international and U.S. companies. And that returned 7%, whereas the S&P was down 3% total for this time period. All right, so this is a difference of more than 10 points. So that should be a really popular investment opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Why did this fund shut down in 2012? Because not enough people, investors, advisors, brokers, institutional investors were investing. Around the 80% of value that you can't see, the patents. All right, so that's weird. So does anybody work for a best company to work for? Fortune's 100 best companies to work for? All right. If you're not, and you're looking for a job, they're hiring. 96,000 jobs by these top 100 companies, including the Bay Area Company. And if you go there with your LinkedIn open, it'll actually tell you who you know there. So since 1998, Fortune has accumulated the 100 best companies to work for. And this guy, Alex Edmonds, who's a Wharton professor, has taken that data from 1998 to 2010, now 2011 and says, does the stock market fully value these 80% intangibles? Does employee satisfaction make stock prices go higher or lower or the same? All right, so what do you think? Does employee satisfaction make go higher? Higher, raise your hand. Yes. Okay, anybody say lower? Anybody say the same? Okay. I, would say, I would say higher, but for not reasons that are obvious because the companies are run better, better profits, but they're not saying we wouldn't want to invest in it because employees are happy. Okay, could be the case. So here's the result. We'll have to unpack why. Is for this time period, for the S&P and Russell indexes, the average return over this time period per year was 4%. If you bought the 1998 best companies to work for list and just held it, like a lot of investors buy and hold, it would have returned 6.5%. If every year you'd buy the best companies to work for and sell the ones that fell off the list, you could make in this time period, 11% per year. Yep. Kind of silly question, is that beta adjusted at all? It is uh, factor adjusted, yeah, yeah. So you can go, if you wanna know more details, Alex Edmonds has the academic paper, he adjusted for size, industry, and, uh, and factors. Okay, so this should be a very popular fund, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. And across the bay, oops, that's one of the charts. So across the bay, Parnassus has a mutual fund company has the Parnassus Workplace Fund. And they don't apply this exact, they don't do it as an index. HIP now does it as an index. But what Parnassus does is it takes that list of 100, which actually are only 45 public companies. So this is based on the public companies. There's actually 45 private companies and 10 nonprofits. So Teach for America is now on the list of the best companies to work for, as well as eight healthcare systems, nonprofit healthcare systems. So what Parnassus does is it takes those 45 and then it buys and sells inside those 45, an actively managed strategy. Which, uh, I cut the chart, but you can look it up on the plan. So what's happening here is in this 80%, as the companies are pressing lower on switching out different income jobs or different jobs altogether, is the workers, U.S. worker share of GDP is now the lowest on record that the Fed is tracking. And simultaneously, corporate profits are the highest ever on record as a percentage of GDP. And the reason that's happening is either fewer jobs or jobs that are not US workers. So these are global multinational companies that are sourcing labor and serving around the world. So workers share mean they're the payroll. This is US worker income um. is the lowest as a percentage of GDP since the 1940s when we tracked. All right, so to the point of how do you track this then? Is this, is human capital trackable? So this is a company called Infosys. It's actually one of the few companies in the world that actually does this. So they look at their book value, which is this is financial, generally accepted accounting principles book value. So these are the buildings and parks, the buildings and computers that they own. And then this red line is the stock market value. So you can see the dot-com bubble here and the 2008 meltdown here. And this black line is the human capital value. And this formula for how to calculate the asset value of human capital was actually developed four decades ago. 
before I was born, 1967, mm -hmm. when the Harvard Business Review published an article saying, put people on your balance sheet as an asset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the designer of this particular application is Baruch Lev, who is a professor at NYU. He was a PhD student at the time. There were four competing methods for how to calculate human capital value. And this is the one that Infosys uses. And as you can see, this is a better fit with this red line and this green line. Because for Infosys, which is the IBM equivalent, based in India, a global company, operates in the US, based in India. When you add up this green and blue, it basically nearly fits this red line. And after the 2008 meltdown, you can see the stock market value came down, and the human capital <coughs> value went up. What did Infosys do? in late 2008 and 2009 that drove their human capital value higher in a global recession. They hired, they hired from their competitors. <laughs> their competitors <laughs> laid off talented people and Infosys hired them. And when they recovered, you can see the multiplier value went higher just like it did in the past. So this is why human capital, environmental capital, social capital are all important factors. They at least correlate with market value. But here's the really compelling reason. These are market growth rates. This is a subsegment of the industry growth rate for these factors, food, electricity, fuel, healthcare, building products. So the US industry growth rates are here, single digit growth. This is double digit growth. What are those markets? Organic food, growing at double digits versus single digits. Renewable energy growing at double digits versus single digits. Alternative fuel growing at double digits versus. Single digits. This is a top line revenue driver. Those, those are all, I mean, low numbers, percentages. You get the highest percentages yeah, I know. So, I mean, from the current smallest market. But do you want to be investing in serving single digit markets with high competition, or do you want to be invested in double digit growth markets where you can be the leader? So these are questions for companies to ask about where is the growth coming from? This is top line revenue growth. And so companies that are serving these top line revenue growth, which include companies like Dow, DuPont, General Electric, industrial and material companies. When you go to the Dow or DuPont homepage, they're talking about sustainable agriculture. When you go to General Electric's annual report, it references eco-imagination, which is more than 15% of its top line revenue. So this isn't just small ventures focusing on small high growth markets. These are large companies serving double digit growth markets that will become large markets that may eventually migrate to being single digit growth. But this is how you create growth. So what this means is this 80% intangible value, if you go up the chain. So when I worked at McKinsey, one of the things we did was how do you create your own? Shareholder value is your market value divided by your weighted average cost of capital over a period of time. How do you get your market value? It's the profit, which is revenue minus cost. So either you're creating products that are growing revenue, or you're managing business that are managing these future risks and optimizing your cost structure. And when you do that, when you take this human needs-based view on companies, who are made up of people, whose number one cost and asset is people. Employees get motivated. I want to solve a social problem through business. I want to solve a social problem through investing. I want to save energy, water, waste, and help the bottom line grow. I want a diverse board of directors and staff to maximize the strength and intelligence of our overall organization. So when you do that, all of these factors map directly into the financial statements. So one of the things we do at HIP is we actually quantify what that does, what the revenue cost, capital spending, cost of capital. And you can look at it from what products you're selling, how you're managing your cost structure, how you're competing against your competitors, and you end up with both an impact score and a reduction of risk and a potential enhancement of return. So now even Harvard knows this. Harvard has done a 15-year study of public companies based on data that's similar to the data that we use. 
that shows that low sustainability companies lag high sustainability companies around results. Not around this historical thing of do you have a policy, a safety policy, an environmental policy that actually doesn't have a high correlation. BP had a safety policy and environmental policy before they polluted the Gulf of Mexico. So companies that sustainably and systematically integrate solving human needs in a way that correlates with their business model to serve new customer markets that are high growth markets and more efficiently manage water. Around the globe, we systematically undercharge for water. We're all getting, at least, we're all getting a free ride till the water is at risk. Like, as we know, Yosemite is on fire. 85% of water in San Francisco comes from the Hetch Hetchy. Should the water ash pollute the water, the San Francisco water supply and Bay water supply could be affected. Do you, do you have feedback that? Yeah. It, it, it looks, it was obvious just like that all of the Delta was a, a cure before like 1999 and then since it's been tracked. Uh, well, the, uh, you can see this on the paper. There will be times when it outperforms and when it outperforms. In this, there's a, there's a delta here. There's, yeah. the, there's a delta here. Look, there's at, a delta look at the here. change of the delta. It looks like from 2000, that's where all the delta was. And then since then, they did the same. This is just a gross return chart. It does not include the risk volatility assessment. And so some of the delta is on return and some of the delta is on reduced risk. So typically what we find, uh, you don't see it on this chart here, but if you do a financial analysis, it's the volatility of unsustainable companies is higher. So for example, there actually is a mutual fund called the Vice Fund. <laughs> it invests in companies that sell tobacco, cigarettes, uh, nuclear energy, and gambling. And that actually beats the S&P 500. So if you bet on Vice, on a gross basis, you can uh, outperform the S&P 500. It has twice the risk, <coughs> twice the volatility of another mutual fund called Portfolio 21, which focuses on solving environmental solutions. So they both outperform. One outperforms with less risk. All right, and so over a period of time, if you look at not only if this is the S&P 500, not only the yellow factor, which is human capital, but the green factor, which includes these other intangibles over time, it is possible to beat the S&P. And even Bloomberg uh, sees this with a carbon disclosure project. So these are companies, more than a thousand companies globally, report their equivalent carbon, their use and pollution of energy. And what they found over time, and this just goes from 05 to 11, when you extend it out, it still holds, um, is that the companies who are disclosing they may not even be good performers. The companies who are disclosing, who are transparent, that give investors the ability to assess that future risk, have a higher gross performance. And they end up having a lower risk as well. So, and on diversity, similarly. So Deutsche Bank, the tree-hugging global investment bank, <laughs> did an analysis from 2005 to 2011 of 2,500 companies, public companies. These public companies either had zero women on the board of directors or one or more women on the board of directors. So for companies with zero women on the board of directors, and they exist, they had an average return on equity of 12% and a more volatile line than companies with one or more women on the board of directors, which averaged 16%, a 33% premium, with less volatility. Deutsche Bank's study. And UBS has just published a report that um, uh, recommunicates uh, some of this as well. All right, so the evidence is stacking up. And in, and in actuality, there's another paper that takes all the papers that do this type of analysis and summarize them. And basically say that half to two thirds of the papers show financial outperformance or reduced risk, and the rest are neutral. And at most, one paper shows an inverse relationship. So by solving human needs, human, social, environmental needs, across all asset classes. So this is from Mercer. So Mercer's a financial consultant that advises institutions, pensions, endowments, cities, county, states. And they've taken all 5,000 funds in their database, which are most uh, funds, uh, most large funds that pass institutional screens. 
And they split it up by equity, fixed income, property, infrastructure. You can have Lauren talk about these categories. And so this red arrow covers the green portion of these lines that say the highest proportion of funds integrating some form of environmental social governance is private equity. And that maxes out out of one of four funds. Three out of four funds are not looking at the ESG factors about future risk and potential return. The lowest hedge funds, also fixed income, which includes muni bonds which are supposed to stimulate local investing in infrastructure, Port of Oakland, City of Oakland, Oakland School District. So all of these are 25% or lower, some in low single digits, and so the investment funds have not yet caught up with implementing factors that reduce risk and can enhance return. Yep, question. Do you know if those percentages are percentages of number of firms or assets under management? This is supposed to be a firms. It could be that they have a higher percentage of assets. I, it's not that different when you put in assets. Uh -huh. it's, it's similar to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Okay, so I uh, need to go to Mercer to check out uh, a little bit more detail. So what you can do as an investor is you can actually apply uh, this to how you track different asset classes by their impact. In this case, it's the HIP score. Their yield, return, liquidity, and risk. And so for numbers-oriented people, this is an exciting graph. Because it looks like you're a traffic control. <laughs> well, you can convert it into something more visual. It shows you on this axis, instead of impact, this is risk. This is return. The size of these bubbles is the proportion of a portfolio. And green, yellow, red is positive impact, neutral impact, negative impact. And so for this particular portfolio, you can see the bubbles above or below the efficient frontier, which is this is supposed to be the optimal trade-off of risk and return. So in some cases, you see either low transparency or low sustainable performing up here, but you also see some you know, performing competitively here. So this is one investor's portfolio. It's not a market portfolio. But you can visualize your portfolio now, not just in risk and return, but also impact. So this is like a 3D version of that first graph of how much impact and how much profit. So locally, you can invest locally uh, in local banks. So like uh, one Pacific Coast is here in the East Bay, New Resource Bank over in San Francisco. These is how you allocate your cash. You can do this across muni bonds, cities, county, states, education, and the like. You can start to rate like a water utility based on their quality of water. So this is publicly available data about performance, about utilities that serve you, who are nonprofit or government operated, that you are funding a tax benefit for, to see how competitive they are. And now you can start to put them on a competitive graph of who's serving citizens and customers the best. And potentially, it's also an indicator for us. So we did this for all the cities who have filed for bankruptcy uh, in the past 15 years. And every municipality that has filed for bankruptcy has had, when we went back and did the data, a low HIP score. Low service to customers, low reinvestment. Oops. So, um, and today when you get a, um, when you get a uh, bond rating from S&P, Moody's, or Fitch, you're getting something paid for by the issuer, not by the investor, and they are rating the financial impact of the next three to five years. They are not rating the full life of the bond. So that's a missing element of doing impact investing. All right, so that's the act. So what we uh, have put together is if new capital and new jobs went to impact investing, which are growing at double digits, that full employment is possible, faster than expected. Because historically, when we analyze the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, jobs in the impact sector are growing, while jobs in the business sector without impact are receding. And that government jobs, which did grow in the 2010s, are now shedding jobs. So if we want to rebuild society, if we want to re uh, foster middle class income, expansion of job growth, if we want to build on innovation, we can accelerate the path uh, to full employment faster. 
All right, so that's a very distilled version. Uh, Lauren's going to show you how that applies in a place-based <laughs> operating way. And I'm really excited that she can uh, show this to you because um, she's looking at it from a trustee's point of view. What are the institutional, how to overcome the institutional barriers to invest locally, sustainably, and for positive impact and potential profit? So you can see after collecting some evidence, it's like, we have to do this. And I realized that from the United Way's point of view as, as a chairman of the investment committee and understanding my fiduciary duty, it's like, uh, of course we have to do this. If we don't do this, it's going to be crazy. And then let alone the idea that we want to align with our mission. Yeah, so, just do down arrow. Yep, down arrow. So we're, I've told you a little bit about how the genesis was. Just somebody said, uh, you know, what are you doing? I said, nothing. We'll look into it and get back to you. So that's the more I looked into it. Uh, this was from the Heron Foundation. This was a really insightful one. This talks, of, uh, some people were thinking that impact investing is predominantly in private equity right now because you can really point to the impact and you can often get that kind of transparent uh, transparency that you want to see. But really, impact investing is an entire scale with the grant being on the, the far end. There's no financial return and a lot of impact. Or you get up here and you've got lots of financial return and lesser impact or lesser liquidity or some other sort of trade-off. So I think of it as a continuum. We can't have the same amount of impact with the same kinds of uh, securities because you have to have a diversified portfolio and you give, you give up some in this uh, trading off idealism and pragmatism. And then there's themes. And the one we took a look at, this came out of the Rockefeller white paper, but community development, you know, you can put your cash in community CDs, some notes, microfinance, activism with the public equity, that's the way you have impact in stocks is, is corporate engagement or venture capital, real estate, affordable housing. So, in this kind of graph, we were looking along this community development as part of our proxy for reducing, uh, alleviating poverty by half, by 2020. And they're doing it. They've got people on the ground, meeting people, helping them. And I thought, what if we could get them more money to do this? And so what could we do with our little $4 million portfolio, knowing that we needed to make market returns to meet our fiduciary duty and uh, not take any extra risk. So there was a process offered in the research that says articulate your mission. That's the first thing you want to do because if you can't have a defined mission, then you're going to not know where to take it. And your themes, and within our alleviating poverty, community development, affordable housing, employment, we went to the United Way staff and said, you guys know all about poverty. What are the drivers of poverty? What are the drivers to get people out of poverty? And they said, well, there are two really important, outside of education and things like that, but uh, job and affordable housing and access to medical care and transportation. Those are the sorts of things. And we said, OK, that's the kind of stuff we can at least begin to, to look at and develop a, uh, a portfolio. But there was nothing that existed out there that would align us with mission, let alone align us in the Bay Area. So we started talking to money managers and uh, saying, how could we build this? And what did we want to have as the characteristics within this? It was curious that the board member at the United Way who challenged us with this question, she was really coming from a labor point of view. And her idea was, I don't want Walmart in the portfolio. I said, you know, we need a little bit better definition than that for our investment policy statement. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to have a rules-based process about what would end up in the portfolio or out of the portfolio. So it could be objective and not subject to any one board member or trustee's point of view or particular value system. So we knew we had to create some common values that we could agree on. And the universe of stocks was the first question. Where, oh, if we want to invest in the Bay Area, how do we do that? Fortunately, we found out that Bloomberg has a Bay Area index. And a couple years ago, it had almost 400 companies that are headquartered in the Bay Area, and they've been tracking it since 2003. But it is a cap-weighted index, and that makes it highly volatile, even against the S&P. And so we said, okay, well, we, 
that's nice to know we have a universe of stocks, um, broadly diversified, as we found out as we started to analyze the benchmark. And we found out if we took that BBACAX and checked it against the tracking error to the S&P, uh, that we were getting either a cap-weighted a cap tracking error, still pretty high, equal-weighted, forget that, but we could optimize it, in, ideally. And then we said, well, there are a few companies in the Bay Area that are missing in the economic sectors like telecom, partly because Pactel was acquired by AT&T, no longer headquartered here. Uh, Bank of America, big United Way donor, big employer, headquartered somewhere else now. So what we want to do is add back a few names that we knew were appropriate for the Bay Area and would help our diversification. So that's where the um, BBA CAX plus 15 uh, was. Quick question. That one. Yeah. Quick question. The, the, the impact theory behind investing in this index is theoretically you're investing in Bay Area companies and capital going to these investments that would then drive jobs in the region? Is that your thesis? That was, your, yeah, your thesis? yeah, you're exactly right. If we said, okay, jobs it being a good alleviation of poverty tool, where can we go with our little portfolio? We yeah, can go the to the employers. Is, how does your cash create jobs in these? It stocks? doesn't. Got it. It doesn't because it's an indirect yeah, impact through corporate engagement. And I'll tell you how we, we decided what those factors were. Thank you. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to this. But so, for, so far, we're just still trying to figure out what's our underlying universe and what would be the structure of the portfolio. So BBA, CAX, the Bay Area Index, plus a few others in an optimized format, we could end up with um, you know, a broadly diversified portfolio tracking the Russell 3000, and we said, okay, let's talk about adding these other guys and then looking at how concentrated that portfolio should be. And so we had all those uh, metrics. Then we were said, now let's add the social factor. And some factors have a lot of impact on your mission and some have less. And so this is bullseye is a very familiar um, uh, target idea that people can use to, to understand you can have some impact or moderate impact or no impact, but hopefully you do no harm, at least with your investments. And within the database that we were using, there were 25 categories with corporate governance containing like a, a mix of seven or eight of them. So our job creation was one of the, the highest relevant to poverty things, labor relations that was um, understanding uh, the workforce, how many strikes, do you treat your employees well, and corporate recognition, something Paul brought up, the top 100 companies. We, if you're working for a good company or you feel like you are, that's a good sign. Um, moderately relevant, we thought, and this was done in a group session of the investment committee and some other staff and board members from the United Way. So we thought, how does a company, if you want a good job, then you want benefits and you want uh, uh, diversity and you want non-discrimination policies. And you, so you, we could decide what represents a good company and a good job. And these were the factors that we could get objective scores on through databases. And we waited those so that each company in the underlying universe could get its own unique uh, score, ESG score, unique to the United Way's priority ranking system of factors. And that added up, and so uh, with job creation being defined by the universe. So we we're just trying to support jobs indirectly by owning stocks in companies. We said we want to tilt the portfolio so that we can maximize our custom ESG score at the same time.